This week, I really wanted to strip the paint off this ugly car, but there's a problem. She's got lopsided hips. All right, new metal is on its way for that rear flare. So it's probably best to wait and strip and prime all at once. I know. Ooh. So I guess that means it's time for a rust repair. Ugh. Garage time. Hey guys, my name's Tom, and this channel is all about inspiring you to build your dream car. Because if I can do it, anyone can. One of the advantages of this car is it's pretty solid and rust free. Now, the front suspension pan is anything but solid. And I think one of the reasons for that is when this car was wrecked and abandoned in a field somewhere, the battery may have cracked or leaked. And once that acid gets into that hollow cavity, it is toast. So it's pretty common in these cars, especially in the non-galvanized cars, for that suspension pan to be worn out and rusted. So that's what we're gonna take a look at today. Okay, so at first glance, it doesn't look that bad from the inside. This is the battery tray. This area right here is where the battery goes. And so the thought is that once the battery leaks, it all sort of seeks into these low points in the seams here, and then it goes underneath. And here's what it looks like from the bottom. So right now you're looking at the uh, driver's side, which is just underneath the battery. There are, as you can see, huge holes here. You know, that acid or the corrosion can travel all the way down to the passenger side. So there's even a bigger hole over here. And this is where the suspension arms attach. So this is a, an important area of the car and needs to be repaired correctly. Obviously it's not just patching holes, it's also getting this alignment correct. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. All right, I'm gonna start by deconstructing this whole area. So this panel here, which creates the hollow section, I'm gonna remove it from the top. It's spot welded all along its seams here and along here. So that means uh, stripping paint and exposing spot welds. Normally you don't want this stuff in the seams, but because we're removing this panel anyways, it's fair game. Okay guys, here we have the uh, exposed spot welds with the undercoating removed. I didn't try to remove all the rust in the first pass. I'm just trying to expose the spot welds so I can get this uh, whole cover off. So I've just been going down with the, well first it was a center punch and then it was a spot drill just creating that, that starting uh, conical shape so that the spot weld cutter doesn't wander all over the place. I'm gonna go to the last step, which is the spot weld cutter now. Okay, I just finished doing the final drilling with the spot weld drill, and you can see the, the uh, spot weld drill goes through the first layer, but not quite the second layer. So oftentimes you'll see you know an area of rust that's right when the two panels join together. So when you see the rust um, coming through the, the drilling puddle or the drilling filings, then that's when you stop. Okay guys, I'm now working on the, uh, I guess the passenger side wall. And I just wanna zoom in and, and sort of show you how the seam is welded on the edge of this suspension pan. This car must have been built on a Friday because what I'm seeing here are factory welds that are very porous and uh, just poor welds in general. But it has held up over the years. You know, this car is 45 years old and these welds are, are, are holding, holding there, but uh, they just don't look pretty. Okay, so I finally got all the spot welds broken free. And so now we're about to reveal what is underneath this uh, hidden cavity here. Probably not a Porsche treasure, but it looks like, I mean, the inside, you know, it has remnants of paint left in, which is great. This part isn't too bad. I don't know if I'm gonna save it or not, but look at down here. This is like a village of tetanus. 
just like pounds and pounds of just flaky matter. Originally, I thought maybe I could just, you know, figure out where the thin sections are and replace it. But this looks like the whole front piece is uh, going to need to be replaced. So I need to go back to the catalog and order this front suspension pan, probably from Restoration Design or maybe Sierra Madre, I'm not sure. Here are the tools that were used to take off that panel. Um, because this is such a common repair, I want to make sure that you know exactly how I did it if you want to try it yourself. Um, this is just a spring-loaded center punch. This is a center drill or countersink. It's just something uh, short and stubby to create a little bit of a pilot hole. This is the um, spot weld cutter. It's, it's uh, four spot weld cutters. It does have a point to it, but that point is small and it tends to wander. That's why I start with this in most cases. And then this is a heavy duty uh, chisel or putty knife. It's kind of a little bit more than a putty knife. It's kind of a cross between a chisel and a putty knife. It's made by, uh, by Hyde. And then this one is an actual putty knife. It's much thinner. You can see how it gets kind of banged up and distorted. But this is good for uh, tight fitting panels if you need to squeeze it in between there. And then this is useful. I used this end here in some tight areas up against the, uh, the fender bulkheads just in order to get the thing fully released. And this is a pretty heavy uh, hammer just to get things done quickly. All right, bear with me for a little bit because I'm gonna show you how I ensure that the suspension points are in the correct place. And I'm gonna show you the measurement method that I use. You know, most people will say that you need a select bench to do this job correctly. And I'm gonna show you my way. I think it's every bit as good as having a select bench, but it's, uh, it just takes longer. So a select bench is like any other tool. It's a time saver. But I'm gonna show you my technique. This is what I enjoy of this aspect. I mean, this is kind of a creative method. Um, kind of gets your wheels turning, makes this restoration. Um, it's kind of a mental game, you know. This is kind of something that uh, it, it's, it's hands-on work, but it's also kind of a mental exercise too. So check it out. Okay, this method starts back here. So I'm at the rear of the car, and I have this aluminum C-channel located on the floor. And this has been welded on the ends so that it holds a liquid. The liquid here is Windex, which is a low viscosity, low surface tension fluid. It's able to level itself within the channel across the width of the car. The torsion bar tube in the back in this car I trust is straight, just based on the way that the chassis looks. You know, there's been no accident damage in the rear and the fact that it's the strongest point of the car means this is a good place to start. I've shimmed the um, C channel so that it's level with the floor. I just use this as a piece of tape measure that, that's cut off. It has a 16th inch increments. And I go back here right where the solid shim is. And because it's a, it's a blue fluid and a yellow tape, I can pretty accurately see where the fluid touches on the lines. So on this side, it's, it's 5 sixteenths. And I've done the same thing on the other side. I'm, I'm probably not gonna walk over there right now, but um, this is level within, I think the measurement error here is, is about, you know, what I can see on this tape measure, it's probably about half of a 16th. Okay, this is just a, a piece of, of tubing um, with a, a nut welded onto the end and then a stop nut and an adjustable bolt. So this becomes a height gauge. I'm able to set it on top of the channel and measure the height of various components underneath here. So. I'm gonna show you the outer torsion bar tube, but what I really care about is the inner tube that's part of the car, that's welded onto the car, not the movable suspension part. But I'm just gonna show you because I don't, it's hard to get the camera underneath there. I'm gonna climb underneath there, and kind of show you how this would work relative to the channel. Okay, so I'm under the car, here's the torsion hole. Um, here's a square, it's just sitting relative to the um, shim I have underneath the channel. And then here's my height tool. So as I rest it on top, of the channel, I square it up with the gauge, and sure enough, right here at the top, it is just barely touching, okay? So I can feel the resistance, I can rock it back and forth to get the maximum resistance, and that is the height of the passenger side, or this is the driver's side, sorry. So I'm gonna do the same thing on the other side to ensure that the car is level relative to the liquid level. And the liquid level is proven by the Egyptians to be flat. So bam, there you go. 
So here's a quick shot of this side of the car. So on this side, um, this is the passenger side. It didn't require any shims on the floor. You know, the, the shim on the other side was just to create the, you know, the floor is not level. So um, that's that. But then on this case, this tire needed to have a shim to raise the uh, suspension up a little bit. Okay, I've moved my leveling rig now to the front and I'm gonna check that the existing suspension points are still level. Uh, so let me show you how I do this on the front. You should never trust the garage floor to be level, but from here to here over the front where the, where the suspension is, I have the same reading left to right. I'm using the same method with the adjustable, the adjustable height gauge. So I'm just loosening the bolt and then once it fits tight, I cinch down the nut. You should also check it with the square just to make sure there's no angular um, misalignments when you're doing this. So I check it in two directions, check it here, can also check it from here. So check the other side and make sure it's all twist free. It's about a one millimeter or about a, maybe a sixteenth of an inch difference between left and right. So um, this is pretty minor. Um, you know, I've already gone through this exercise before when I was checking the, uh, the rear suspension points back here. So I got it pretty close. I think some of the banging we did to get the hood aligned might have moved it a little bit. So I'm just going to whack it back down a millimeter and then, you know, have a perfect reference before the new one goes in. But of course, I'm going to check the new one um, as it goes into. Okay, I got lucky on that one. Um, it did move just a little bit. Uh, this is, you, you can just barely hear some resistance there as it contacts the bolt. So now these front mounts are level from left to right, but that's just to determine if it's level. Now, I've already done a lot to determine that this cross member across this here is level, and I've done that before when I was fixing some of the sheet metal and the inner fender and the, and the inner floors down there. So I don't need to check that anymore. I know I've done it like probably five times. Everything here from front to rear is uh, level with no twist. So now I'm gonna show you how to um, measure the distance between suspension points. Okay, step one was to get everything planar, meaning no twist from front to rear on all the suspension points. And I've done this repeatedly to fix some accident damage, like I mentioned before. Now to measure distances correctly, um, there's this tool, which is called a uh, tram gauge. And it's just a long aluminum piece. I'll put a description um, with a link to you know, where I got this in the, in the description below. But uh, really it's, it's, it's kind of a, a fancy tape measure. It has these adjustable points that go inside a hole and uh, just measure hole to hole distances. It's pretty stout, you know, so you get a good accurate measurement. Uh, a little bit more accurate than a tape measure, but it, and it does have a tape measure on it, but I typically will just compare um, left to right and then the, the diagonals. When you compare the diagonals, if the diagonals are identical, then you know it's square. So this is really helpful to check for squareness and correct uh, suspension component placement. Also, these um, factory dimensions are available in the workshop manual, which I printed out. I'm down here under the car, and I'm gonna try to show you how this is done in practice. I'm gonna measure the diagonal, and because the suspension is in for right now, I'm going to put a socket over the um, head of the bolt, and that's going to allow me to find the center of the bolt without taking the bolt out. I am gonna take it out later, but for right now, I'm gonna place this right on top. And then it comes over here. This suspension point has a hole. You can see the hole right here. It's already there. Um, so I'm just gonna take a measurement from here to here. This will actually go right inside there. So now I know the distance across the diagonal. Okay, this here is the measurement from front to back. So I have this, you know, you can see how strong this is. I'm trying to wiggle it back and forth, make sure I have the best fit of the tool into the sockets. So this is a good measurement from front to back. And then I'm gonna remove it from here, relocate it to the other side. From point to point, 
It's 70.2 70, 70 centimeters. 70.2 centimeters, or um, I start at the 10, so it's, that's actually 60, 602 millimeters. Okay, I just printed out the workshop manual and it shows the distances from, this is where the cross member attaches. That's where I was putting the large 17 millimeter socket, or maybe it was a 19 millimeter socket on this bolt. Then I was measuring to the forward bolt. So it's 497.3 millimeters and then 105 extra millimeters from the rear to the front. So I added that up and it's 602.3. And I measured um, 602. So the tolerance on, on this is plus minus, it's plus minus one, and then there's another plus minus um, 0.25 millimeters. So this is well within tolerance. These are the numbers that I'm gonna use when it's time to position the new pan um, the new pan's gonna go right here. When I position the distance, when I cut it, I'll cut it right here, but then when I weld it back in, that distance will become really important. Okay, for those of you that think close is good enough, you know, check this out. So this is the position of the, the front um, suspension point attachments, and if it's off by a little bit, you can see how much the wheel shifts due to the position of these attachments. And you can also see the leverage that the wheel has on this point here in the chassis. So this is a pretty high stress area as it goes through braking and cornering, you're, you're transferring forces up into the front of the chassis. A 10 millimeter change in position of this front attachment point is probably at least 10 millimeters of change in the axle location, but it's also um, squareness. So if it's not square here at these pickups, then your axles won't be square either. So this stuff is very important, guys. All right, I decided to use my plasma cutter on uh, getting most of this suspension pan out, and then I'll go back and break all the spot welds off at the correct seams. So here's the conservative cut, um, nowhere near the seams that it needs to be cut at, but this is just to remove, you know, 90% of it so that the last 10% can be done um, much with much better access. So now that's gone, I'm going to clean up the uh, edges with some of that paint stripper, expose the spot welds, and just keep on drilling. All right, truth be told, I'm getting a little tired of drilling out spot welds, and rust is just hard on the soul. So today, I'm taking a little road trip, and I'll show you where. And here we are at Pelican Parts. Thanks, Pelican. Here are, this is the new uh, suspension pan. So this is the single most expensive part that I have bought to this bought for this car um, to date. Please come back next week and let's get this installed and watch me uh, line it up.